Hello, thank you so much for joining us today for Ask a Conservator, Materials Matter. I'm Gabriella Kahn from the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives Advancement Team, and I am so pleased to welcome you to our program. I want to gratefully acknowledge the Piscataway on whose ancestral homelands I live, as well as the diverse and vibrant Native communities who make their home here today. Before we really jump in, I just want to say that we hope that everything will go as smoothly as possible, but just in case anything happens, uh, please bear with us. We are recording the program so that we can share it with those who weren't able to be here today, or if there are any technical issues. And just like so many of you, our speakers today are at home with families and pets. Uh, so please excuse any potential background sounds or surprise visitors. So as you probably know by now, the former Smithsonian Libraries and the Smithsonian Institution Archives have joined forces to better serve researchers, curators, educators, and learners of all ages at the Smithsonian and around the world. We are now the world's largest museum, library, and archive system, and we aim to fulfill the institution's mission for the increase and diffusion of knowledge. And a crucial part of our work to fulfill that mission is preservation and caring for our collections, many of which are irreplaceable. So thanks to their skills and expertise, as well as support from our very generous donors, our conservators preserve and care for books, documents, photographs, audio visual, visual files, and so much more um, for use by curators, researchers, students, and, and really any curious person who has a question that might be answered by our collections. So for us, preservation is really a large umbrella under which everything from mending a torn page to proper collection storage and handling to emergency preparedness and international disaster relief efforts falls. But today, we're going to take you on a journey from ancient times to the present, touching on the history of sharing and recording information and how that has influenced preservation that happens today. So we'll be discussing and showing you the various formats and materials that our conservators handle and explaining the impact of those formats and materials on treatment strategies and solutions. And of course, we'll have time for you to ask a conservator your own questions. So with that, I would like our speakers to introduce, them, introduce themselves. So uh, Daniel, let's start with you. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Daniel Vilcek. And I'm the book conservator for the, the Off the Book program uh, for the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives. Um, at the Conservation Lab, I treat books from our special collections, particularly the Dibner, Coleman, and Cooper Hewitt. Um, I arrived at the Smithsonian at the end of 2019, so I was lucky to spend three months at our Conservation Lab before the shutdown. Um, I'm originally from Israel, where I worked for six years as the book conservator at the National Library of Israel. Uh, I had my formal training in conservation at Palazzo Spinelli. It's a small art school in Florence, Italy. And, and my family and I moved from Israel to Vancouver, Canada in 2016, where I worked for three years uh, as a book binder in a small bindery. And from there, we moved here to DC. And uh, I'm excited to be here and share what we do with all of you. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Keala Richard. Um, I'm the General Collections Conservation Technician at Smithsonian Libraries and Archives. Um, I'm originally from Hawaii, and I earned my Master of Library and Information Science degree at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. Um, my job primarily focuses on treatment of non-rare, bound, and flat paper objects in our collections that were published after 1840. Um, I also stabilize materials before and after digitization and assist our exhibitions team with rotating objects on display in our museums. So thanks everyone for having me. Hi, 
Hi, everybody. I'm Allison Ruppert Gerber, Preservation Coordinator for the Smithsonian Institution Archives, which is now part of the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives. As Preservation Coordinator, I oversee all preservation related activities at the archives, which include collection, need, and risk assessment, preventive conservation tasks, budgeting and procurement, and long term preservation strategies and initiatives. Since coming to SIA in 2015, I've led a pan-institutional audiovisual survey and preservation readiness assessment that was completed in 2019, and I'm now developing the audiovisual media preservation initiative to support audiovisual preservation across the Smithsonian. Prior to coming to SIA, I was a conservation technician for the Baltimore Museum of Art and then the National Museum of African American History and Culture where I was able to build my conservation skill set through working with a wide variety of materials. Thank you so much, Allison, and all of you. Um, so we're going to jump right in and um, we're, we're going to start with Daniel. So Daniel, as our adopted book conservator, I know that you mainly treat the books in our special collections, which go all the way back to the very earliest days of printed books. And so on our journey this evening from ancient times to today, told through the perspective of book and archival preservation. Can you tell us about how we got to the modern form of the book that we all know and love today? Yes, happily. Um, I would like just to um, add that um, my role as a conservator for the adoptive book program, I treat mostly bound material from the 50,000 items in our special collections. In our conservation lab, I treat these old books individually and comprehensively, so they will continue to be available to our patrons for many years to come. So yeah, as, as a book conservator, when I look at a book, my first thought is, how is this book constructed? So I prepared a short presentation to share with you a little about the history of books from a structural point of view. Next slide, please. So throughout history, the term book was used to describe many forms of media. For instance, a scroll or a clay tablet containing cuneiform writing were referred to as books. A famous example from antiquity is the library of Ashurbanipal, which contains thousands of clay tablets. What we call today a book was originally called codex. Codices have been with us for so many centuries, and the reason why they have endured for so long is not only historically interesting, it is, it is also important question to ask from our point of view as preservation professionals. Excuse me. Uh, one approach to the question of why codices have been used for so long is to go back to a time when scrolls were the main book main book form in use. In the Western ancient world, codices and scrolls coexisted for centuries. One beautiful evidence is seen in the left image above of a fresco from Pompeii. You can see a book and a scroll and other writing instruments next to each other. The scroll is much older though, the earliest evidence being from Egypt beginning in 2400 BC. The codex was invented much later by the Romans. This form of book is first mentioned in the first century AD. But for a few more centuries, scrolls were still more popular. Libraries throughout the Roman Empire contained mostly scrolls. You can see an example above the legendary Hellenistic library in Alexandria, which according to evidence had many thousands of scrolls. Scrolls were revered as the traditional form of book, perhaps similarly to how today printed books are often referred to or preferred upon Kindle books. Another obstacle keeping the codex from becoming more popular in its early days was the fact that most common material used in the ancient Western world was the papyrus. And its qualities are very different than paper we know today. Papyrus folds poorly, so it is not so suitable to be used for codex. Nevertheless, the codex was gaining popularity during the second to four centuries, particularly among Christian communities. 
There were many reasons for preferring the Codex. Among them is the fact that it was the more economic option since both sides of the writing surface were used. While writing on scrolls was done only on one side, you can see in the image to the left, um, the, scroll that, the scroll that was found in Egypt in the second century AD, there is no writing on the back. Another crucial issue was that it could be opened flat at any page for easier reading. Being bound with wooden boards or other durable material made it more compact and safer to transport than the scroll. There was also a more symbolic reason. The early Christians may have wanted to distinguish their writings from the pagan and Judaic texts written on scrolls. As you can see uh, in the right image, fourth century AD, Codex number two, part of the Nag Hammadi collection. This codex is one of the oldest complete Christian manuscripts ever to be found. And clearly the Christian communities adopted the form of codex from early on. So there was this shift, this cultural shift happening. And when the Roman Empire declined, so did the scroll. Papyrus, the most common material in use, became difficult to obtain due to the lack of contact with Egypt, and parchment became the main writing material. Parchment, parchment was very suitable for the codex format, and that, this, that set the fate of the scroll. Monasteries around the Roman Empire had scriptoriums, which were workrooms where monks copied and bound the content of scrolls into codices, and those scrolls were seldom preserved after. So from then on, we have this modern form of the book and the impact of this shift is evident in the fact that the Smithsonian libraries and archives, like other libraries around the world, have so many old books that survived for centuries. The codex is a superior form of book in more than one way, but in the few minutes I have, I would focus on its durable structure. The codex, I will call it a book from now on, is designed of a sturdy text block and a cover that provides protection from impact, dust, and light. Until the industrialized age when paper manufacture became cheap, paper was made mostly by hand and was relatively expensive and parchment even more so. So a well-made and strong binding was essential to protect the often much more precious text block, like the one you see here from our special collections. Books evolved through the centuries and binding techniques show the attention that was often given to the book structure, both its sewing and binding. At least until the 19th century, binders intended to make durable and lasting bindings. But even the best bindings eventually age and fail, especially if the book was put into use. Fortunately, however, damaged bindings can be replaced, which adds to its appeal. This is where book conservators come in. A significant part of our work is the rebinding as well as the preservation and conservation of original bindings. When I examine a historical book for treatment, the structural characteristics and qualities must be addressed. The task is significant given that we must consider 500 years of innovation in the book design. This period of innovation started with the invention of the movable type around 1450, which brought about a radical increase in the production and distribution of books. We see more experimentation in the book arts, and this is evident in the diversity of bindings you see in our special collections. Bookbinders experimented with various book structures and materials to try and improve the functionality and longevity of books. Knowledge of these developments of historical binding structures is important for book conservators as they must be able to develop durable and historically sympathetic conservation bindings that also protect and support their contents. By understanding the characteristics and operation of historical bindings, that endured time so well, we'll do a better job preserving them for our patrons to safely use them for centuries to come, as well as for digitization. Uh, here we have um, a book called Adversaria Anatomica Omnia from 1741. It arrived to our lab via the Adopt-a-Book program. 
the book was in general good condition, which is not uncommon when done well. These books, these old books can handle time very well. Nevertheless, the binding failed, uh, failed um, along the hinge. Books as old as this one, even when made of the highest quality leather covering and the strongest sewing supports, often fail over time in the joint area. The joints take most of the stress and have the widest range of movement in a binding, causing the leather around them to crack and the sewing supports to break over time. Even without the stress of frequent movement, leather degrades, degrades over time. To treat this leather, this book, the leather was lifted from the spine and boards and the hinge was reconstructed, reconstructed so the book can be safely used again. And it's also more aesthetically pleasing. This is a kind of treatment that is used for centuries and we can find it also in past treatments of historical bindings. Here we have another example. Um, this book on Omastikon from 1668 is actually waiting to be adopted and it will be available to, for adoption at our upcoming adopt -a book event. You can see here how the board is detached, but the text block is in remarkable condition considering its age. Old books like this one, uh, even when made well, will eventually show this kind of damage. It's interesting to notice that gravity might have played a role causing this damage because the board is detached on the top and downwards. Um, Gabby, if you can go back one slide. You can see that it is detached um, on top and downwards, um, but it's still intact on the bottom of the book. So the book was probably shelved standing and gravity, which imposes its force on the text block and hinges can cause the board to be pulled away on the top more than on the bottom. We can go next to the next slide. Another interesting thing to notice, we don't see damage and deformation to the, to the text block and spine, which gravity and usage might cause on, the, on heavy books like this one. This shows how good worksmanship in a binding can lead to the survival of the most important interior structures. After the binding will be treated, a way to avoid further harm by gravity is to simply shelve the book laying horizontally, horizontally, which was how the books were shelved up until the 16th century. So these are some of the challenges we have when treating books from our special collections. The industrialization of book production in the 19th century brought about a distinct set of considerations and challenges when dealing with the preservation and conservation of books. Keala will, will talk more about this in a moment. Great, thank you so much, Daniel. That was just fascinating. And I also just want to give a, a big shout out to all of our Adopt Book donors and um, just, you know, it's, it's with the funds from Adopt-A-Book that Daniel is able to preserve these books that are falling apart so that they can continue to be used and studied for, for years to come. So we are just so grateful to all of our adopters. Uh, so as Daniel was saying, we, um, he left us off around the 19th century and Kayla is gonna pick up there and tell us more about book engineering and materials, building on the idea of the book as a functional object and sharing with some demonstrations how these things impact her preservation work. So please take it away, Kayla. Thank you, Gabby and Daniel. Uh, my portion of this talk is going to focus on the structure of a book and the material failures that result from the industrialization of bookbinding in the 19th century. Um, first, I want to talk a little bit about the collections that I work with. Our institution considers everything published before 1840 to be a rare book, and with few exceptions, most books published after 1840 are considered general collections. Uh, with over 50,000 rare books in our collection, the general collections make up the majority of approximately 3 million volumes that we currently have in our branches. Uh, the other great thing about our general collections is they are mostly circulating. 
uh, meaning that Smithsonian curators and researchers can check them out to support their various academic work. Uh, in 2019, more than 7,000 general collections books were checked out. And in that same time, our lab treated 619 books, which again, most of them are general collections. Um, to start off, Gabi mentioned the book as an object. And this is the, the core philosophy of our lab, that the book is a functional object. And unlike other items in our museum collections, books are meant to be used. They don't sit behind glass away from other people. Their purpose is to be read and in some cases examined in person. So our job in the conservation lab is to stabilize the book so that it can continue functioning. Uh, but what does it mean to function? Daniel did a really beautiful job explaining the origins of the codex form. And we need to understand the parts of a book to understand how it is engineered for a specific mechanical means of operation. Um, before I start, I wanna to note to everybody that the books I'll be showing you are not library books. Uh, they're either a demo book or practice books from my own personal collection. So no library books were harmed in the making of this show. Um, so to recap, we have the text block, which is composed of single sheets of paper that have been folded down into gatherings called signatures, which are then collated, stacked on top of each other, and sewn through the middle, which forms a gutter. These signatures can be sewn using a variety of different techniques onto support materials of cords or tapes. So here we have a butterfly stitch on a uh, linen tape support, and then a simple stitch on cords. Um, so the sides of the text block are called the top, bottom, and four edges. And the decorative sewn strips you see at the top and bottom are called the end bands. Um, the spine is then glued up and lined with layers of linen or cheesecloth and paper. And here you can see the, the linen or cheesecloth layer underneath the spine of this guy. Um, that layer is usually left wider width uh, of the spine so that it can help attach the book to the case or cover. Um, and a lot of times the paper layers were made of publisher's waste. So you can see here, the spine of this book was lined with a printed page from another book. The blank pages at the front and back of the book are called the end sheets and the outermost sheets are called paste downs. That's literally because they're pasted pages of the book down to get the boards to attach. Um, so here you can see that flange layer that has been lifted off of the board and then the end sheets on top. Um, let's see. Oh, another fun thing about this, if you can, hope you guys can see, you have the, the jute cord that separated as well that's stuck underneath there. So a little bit about the case. When I say case, I'm talking about the cover of a book. Uh, where there are two boards on either side of the book, um, a card or paper spine, and it's all wrapped in a single sheet of buckram or book cloth. So this would have been all one sheet together. Um, the final structure of the book is engineered for a very specific use. So when this all works together, you have the boards protecting the block of the book on all sides, leaving a really small margin so that the edges are tucked away and the block doesn't get that same wear on shelving. And then we have hinges that must be very strong um, to keep the, the boards attached and then sewing supports on the block or spine so that it moves with the block to allow it to be open and read. So when all of this is done correctly, then the spine flexes comfortably concave while you're reading and then returns to its original shape when it's closed. So what happens when this fails? Um, so usually the materials used in a book binding impact how well the book can maintain its functionality. 
And likewise, the original manufacturing processes in bookbinding also affect how the book ages. So here we have images of a woman in or at a traditional sewing frame, sewing a text block. And then the image to the right of that shows a woman sewing a book by feeding collated pages into a machine. Um, the general idea behind these were much the same as modern clothing sewing machines. It's very abrasive, um, very hard on the pages. Um, one of the most obvious examples, I think, of how manufacture changed the, the book is paper. So um, we'll go back to this guy. Um, in the hand press period, paper was made by hand using long, flexible fibers that came from rags. It was essentially the same type of fibers that were in clothing, um, and the sheets were then treated with gelatin or, and an alum sizing to hold the fibers together. Uh, but by contrast, in the industrial age, paper is now made from wood pulp with a high lignin content and sized with an alum rosin, which made the paper discolored, brittle, and acidic. Um, if you want to know, lignin is a polymer found in cell walls of vascular plants like wood and bark. So what they're using to pulp these. Um, here, let's switch to another page. Here we have paper that probably came from mechanically pulped paper. Um, so we can see how brown and brittle it is. And when it's put under even, you know, minimal stress, you can see here this double fold, it just flakes right off, um, crumbles. And I wanna show you another here. Um, this book was published in 1843. So just barely uh, on the cusp of this period. And it actually has a little bit better paper. So this was probably made with chemically pulped paper. So it's a little better at moving some of the, removing some of the lignin, uh, but the paper is still weak, but it stands up much better to this double fold test. It's, it can take the stress without breaking. Um, this is pretty interesting. Um, another favorite thing that I have about this little guy is the portraits. Um, so you can see here that this tissue was originally, originally meant to um, protect the portraits in the frontispiece here, uh, but you can see that it was much more acidic than the original paper, and I'm not sure if you can see it here, but there's a little color difference between here and here where the, um, the protective tissue laid down, and it's migrated some of that acid onto the paper. Okay, so now we can take a look at some other common preservation issues in books of this time period. So we already saw a lot going on with this book earlier, but I wanna point out a few more things. Uh, right off the bat, we see the joints have failed and the boards are separated. The flange itself was weak and the paste downs were too acidic and cracked can see that right here. You can see how weak that cheesecloth in there was. Um, you can also see that the book cloth was worn down. Um, it was pretty thin, hopefully from lots of use. Uh, but we can see that the, the head cap and tail cap, those are torn and frayed, uh, most because you pull the books off the shelf like this. Please don't do that. Uh, that's what causes that damage. Um, and then we can look inside at the spine itself. So we've got this nice fault, uh, fault line um, where the text block has split. And when I peel back the brittle liner at the bottom here, um, you can see the sewing stations. Um, and there's another, a, a number of things wrong with the sewing on this book here. So first off, it was sewn using a sawn in cords technique. Um, where instead of punching the sewing stations individually into each signature, the bindery took a saw to the collated text block all at once um, to line those up. Um, that made the cords re sit recessed into that, that sawn space so that they weren't visible from the outside of the book cloth. Um, Honestly, this, this isn't necessarily a bad technique in and of itself. Um, 
but because the paper is so brittle, those stations have now gotten larger and larger and larger and can no longer support the sewing. Um, also, the thread used to sew the black is too thin and can cut right through the brittle paper. <laughs> um, but because the sewing is failing and the glue and lining material is no longer supporting the spine, um, when we open it, the gutters and sewing are fully exposed and every movement really breaks more material. And I wouldn't be surprised if this is missing pages or broken signatures. Um, but how do we address these problems? So the guiding rule of conservation um, treatment is do no harm. And our job isn't necessarily to restore the book like new, but instead to stabilize the book so that it can be read or studied. Um, this means that we try to perform the least invasive treatments as possible. And this can range anywhere from just building a custom box to minimize shelf wear and go all the way up to completely disassembling and rebinding a book by hand. Um, how we treat the book really depends on how it's used in the collection and the needs of our librarians. Um, I have over here um, a book that we used as a demo for our booth at the 2019 American Library Association annual conference booth. Um, it shows some of the common repairs that we do in the lab and um, have the, the book originally had the kind of damage that you just saw. So for this book, I originally detached the text block and I cleaned it um, in the same method that you saw in that previous slide, um, scraping off all of the layers from the spine. Um, I sewed on new end sheets using a uh, acid-free grade paper and then line the spine in flexible layers of thin Japanese paper, a um, starched linen flange, and then more acid-free paper, paper to really shore that up, all using a gentle wheat starch paste that will stay on, um, but still be flexible. So for the case, the hinges had failed and the boards were detached. Um, the spine piece had torn and had the same kind of head cap damage that we saw in the last one. You can see how the edges are all frayed. Um, so what I did was I cleaned the crumbling paper that was on the back of that and the, the publisher's waist. And then I lined it in a very thin Japanese paper that was custom toned so that it would match the color on the outside um, as, as closely as possible. And I'm not sure if you can really see on the camera here, but there are a few cracks in here and having that toned paper hides it as, as much as possible and it makes it a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. Um, I used a, a heavier custom tone paper um, to reassemble the case. And I used that same paper to cover the corners where they had previously been uh, worn corners and exposed boards there. Um, that paper was then lined um, on top of a linen substrate to really shore it up and make it stronger. Um, and then we lifted uh, a little bit of the original boat cloth on a smaller margin so that you could slip that underneath and hide it, hide the seams. Um, inside there's a stronger acid-free card paper that sturdies it up. And then we, I <laughs> rolled it a little bit so that it will slide over the curve of the spine comfortably. Um, were this book to be reassembled, um, the flanges and outer end sheets would be pasted down here on top of each other. And then it would be set under weight to dry, usually at least overnight. Um, afterward, the linen spine piece would be reattached. And I would also put in this cute little bookseller stamp <laughs> from when the book was originally sold. Um, we like to keep little objects in there if it came with the book, if there's any kind of um, ephemera stuck with it, because that helps to contextualize the book historically. And 
that brings me to the end of my presentation. I hope you all learned something new. Thank you so much, Kayla. That was awesome. Um, you know, it's I found it so captivating to to have you walk us through, you know, everything that goes into the work that you do to preserve our books. And, you know, it's especially interesting to hear about how in order to inform your work, you know, you have to consider so many different things, the materials, the structure of the item that you're treating, and also the use of the item. Um, and I think that's a nice segue to get us closer to modern day and to talking about preservation of our archives collections, which also requires accounting for their materials, structure, and of course, use. Um, so while Daniel and Kayla have been discussing the treatment of single items, um, Allison is going to tell us some more about looking at preservation from the collection level. So um, Allison, can you tell us some more about that? Thanks, Gabby. Um, as preservation coordinator, a large chunk of my job revolves around the comprehensive preservation management of our collections. So what does this mean exactly? So for archival collections, it means that we employ large scale risk assessment and planning techniques that support the long term preservation of our collections, while also considering the need for access to patrons and researchers. I don't often look at our collections at an item level, but rather consider at-risk collection groupings. Um, and these are often based on the inherent nature of certain materials. And then what preventive methods or mass scale conservation treatment methods we can consider that would better preserve them for future generations. At SIA, our collections contain a wide variety of materials from architectural drawings to photographs to audio and video assets. So each material presents different challenges to preservation. Some of our most challenging collections are highlighted here. The archives has a large collection of panoramic photographs that for years have been stored rolled inside document boxes. Some of these can extend over 100 inches in length and then storing them uh, rolled puts stress on both the emulsion and the carrier layers and without proper treatment for unrolling and flattening, it's nearly impossible for anyone to access the photograph. The archives also cares uh, for architectural drawings from the late 1800s to modern day that document the Smithsonian's history in terms of its physical building development. These present a challenge in terms of space management. And while it may be preferable to store these drawings flat in terms of long-term preservation, many modern day, more robust printings are safe to store rolled inside archival tubes to maximize our use of space. Glass plate negatives can also be found in our collections, which document anything from individual snowflakes to cacti. Unfortunately, due to years of handling and movement, many of the plates have broken. Under normal circumstances, the plates would be stored upright in paper sleeves. However, the archives had to develop special trays to secure the glass pieces and store horizontally. Lastly, scrapbooks can be found throughout SIA and pose one of the largest challenges in terms of long-term housing. Oftentimes, the scrapbook pages are made from highly acidic wood pulp paper that can affect the contents that are secured to the pages. It's often not appropriate to disbind or disassemble the scrapbook due to the risk of dissociation of the contents. So we need to develop creative solutions that mitigate some of the damage while continuing to provide safe access to researchers. So I wanted to highlight a few solutions that we've developed at the archives for long-term preservation. After humidification and flattening, two panoramic photographs, uh, we place them in custom polyester sleeves that are sealed on three sides. So by leaving that top edge open, we can easily remove the photograph if we need to. The photographs are then secured to a piece of archival board to provide additional handling support and a piece of folder stock is attached to the top edge of the board to provide a cover for protection from pollutants and light. And then here I'm working on prepping tubes for the long term housing of oversized exhibition drawings. There were several factors we took into consideration when determining how to house this collection. First, the collection was digitized before it was transferred to the archives so digital surrogates would be available for researchers. 
Um, and so this reduced the need to handle the original drawings. Secondly, limited space was available in our flat file storage. Um, we simply don't have enough room for the drawings to be stored flat. Uh, and then thirdly, the drawings were in stable condition and posed very few preservation concerns. And so for these reasons, rolling and storing uh, in our offsite facility was the best choice for these materials. So once we decided that rolling was the most appropriate choice for storage, we quickly realized how expensive support tubes and tube boxes can be. So while the decision was made to continue using those archival tube boxes for the exterior housing, we achieved the real cost savings with the inner support tubes. Um, rather than using expensive acid-free blueboard tubes, we used more affordable white mailing tubes. But to create a barrier between the non-archival tube and the drawings, uh, three mil uncoated polyester film was wrapped around the tube and secured using polyester double-sided tape. This modification of the housing produced a significant cost savings for us. Um, we ended up only spending about 10% of what we would have using traditional archival materials while still uh, achieving an appropriate housing system for these collections. So one of the most significant projects we've undertaken to address preservation on a mass scale is the development and implementation of the Audiovisual Media Preservation Initiative. While still in the planning stages, this initiative was informed by a four-year pan-institutional audiovisual collection survey and assessment that gathered data about our greatest collection needs and identified several solutions for moving preservation forward at SI. 11 uh, Smithsonian museums, research centers, and archives participated in, in the assessment, so we were able to get a holistic picture of the state of collections around the institution. Audiovisual collections are one of our most at-risk materials at the Smithsonian due to the variety of formats on which content was recorded, the obsolescence of equipment needed to transfer that content, and the sheer volume of individual items that require cataloging and stabilization before digitization. While more uh, traditional preservation methods, such as appropriate housing and environmental controls, may affect the long-term viability of these collections, best practice for preservation typically means digitization in this case. So ABMPI is a partnership between the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives and the National Collections Program, and is guided by a task force comprised of subject matter experts and an advisory committee of senior level leaders. The initiative will also be supported by seven new positions, an initiative coordinator, a curator, preservation specialist, and a rights and reproduction specialist. The main goal of AVMPI is to be a central resource that would alleviate some of the burden from individual Smithsonian museums and research centers to catalog, preserve, and provide access to our audiovisual collections. Um, AVMPI is structured with five main goals in mind. The first and probably largest undertaking will be to design and build a state-of-the-art facility to support the many functions of the initiative. This facility will also provide a space not only for digitization, but for processing, conservation treatment, and temporary storage of collections. The second goal is to prioritize our collections in a meaningful way to determine which collections require immediate preservation due to advanced format degradation and high content value. Uh, next, the ABMPI task force is working to develop workflows that would standardize how we catalog, track, treat, and digitize collections coming through the initiative. Our fourth goal is to ensure that our digital infrastructure can support the large influx of digital files that we'll create uh, through ABMPI. And lastly, we want to create effective communication and access solutions to highlight our audiovisual collections. So once we, once we digitize them, we want people to be able to see them. So during the first phase of the initiative, we have several tasks to accomplish. As I said on the previous slide, creating streamlined workflows for the physical movement of collections, the creation and storage of digital files, and the creation of digital images to document collections is of utmost importance to streamline the preservation process and maximize our resources. Once those workflows are created, we will plan a pilot digitization project for a small grouping of collections to test out those before scaling up. 
Uh, to support the creation of a new facility, the task force will be creating a facility requirement plan to identify specifications for each required area that would support the preservation of collections. Um, next, we would need to reach out to Smithsonian stakeholders to determine who would be able to work with ABMBI to identify their at-risk collections, prepare them for movement, and support the overall digitization of their collections. And then for our rarer audiovisual formats, the initiative will be working with specialized vendors to manage digitization rather than outfitting an in-house digitization space for these collections. Lastly, we'll be working to secure funding for our identified needs and we'll onboard the initiative coordinator and curator to better support the goals of AVMPI. So as you can see, with a wide variety of materials to care for, the archives is continually developing new solutions to ensure that our collections are preserved for many years to come. Uh, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have and thanks for tuning in. Thank you so much, Allison. Um, I think this initiative is, is so exciting and, and forward looking. Um, I mean, we already have such a large amount of audiovisual assets across the Smithsonian, and you know that number obviously continues to to grow. So, um, but on the other hand, they're also some of our most at risk collections, like you're saying. So, um, you know, it it really is such a critical part of um, of our work to take care of these collections and prevent um, you know, as much damage or, or loss of these irreplaceable items um, and make sure that they're still available for future generations. Um, so it's really exciting. Um, so I wanna open it up to our audience questions now. So again, if you do have any questions, please go ahead and submit them um, through the Q&A feature. And we've gotten some, some good questions already. Um, so the first one here um, is, I think, for our book conservators. So do you put all books um, of these ages, so I think talking about the, the special collections, into boxes? If not, do you separate them from each other with something like paper, et cetera? So let's make sure, let's get our book conservators back on here. Hello. Where's Daniel? There's Daniel. I am back. <laughs> so Daniel, I think maybe you can answer this question. For, uh, for rare collections, almost every item uh, is placed in a box. We made a custom uh, specially uh, fitted box to host the book. Um, and yeah, and sometimes books also placed without a box. Um, uh, but most of them are placed in a box for protection. And, and I imagine in the case of books from general collections, um, it might be different. Maybe Kelly, you can tell us more about it. Okay. Um, sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. <laughs> that's that's the, the short answer. So a lot of times what we do with our serialized publications that get digitized for the Biodiversity Heritage Project um, by the time they're done with digitization, they're just, they're not going to get back together. Um, and the librarians have determined that, you know, they don't necessarily warrant the, the time and um, cost of doing full treatments on them. So then we will order um, custom measured boxes from them from a vendor uh, and get them all together at once. Um, Sometimes I, I will still build um, those clamshell boxes for certain volumes. We have books that our, our librarians like to call medium rare. So if they're on that cusp um, of that transition into industrial bindings, then usually they'll, they'll send that over and request full treatment and special care and special box and everything. Or if they're particularly important works. Um, so, you know, we have first and, and second printings of Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. Um, when I get around to doing that again, that will have uh, its own special box. So, yes and no. 
Great. Um, another question, uh, have you had to deal with binding that used metal staples rather than stitching? Yes. <laughs> All the time. And it's terrible because the, the metal usually um, will eat through the, the signature and um, you, you end up just with a rusty nails that, you know, better make sure you have your tennis shot um, and B, just loose pages that then need to be uh, reassembled. And usually what we do with those is we'll gently remove the staples. And if, they, if there is that torn through hole, then we'll patch it up with a, a bit of conservation grade Japanese paper and then sew it uh, old school with a pamphlet stitch. Um, but that's how we handle it. Yes, I see it all the time and hate it. <laughs> um, good to know. <laughs> uh, another question here, please advise why um, we see some handling of materials barehanded and others with gloves on. What's the criteria about gloves or no gloves for materials? This person said, I would have thought best to use gloves all the time. Well, this is how it used to be done. And um, the problem is that um, when you use gloves, actually um, you, you, your dexterity, it, it com um, compromises dexterity um, and the sense of touch, and you can actually cause damage when using gloves. Um, so it's sort of a compromise. What is the best thing to do for, for the books when handling them? So what we do today is make sure our hands are clean and then we can safely use, uh, use the books without gloves, which is, which is ultimately better. Uh, for photographic collections, it's typically you want to wear gloves with those because the emulsion layer of the photograph is more sensitive and you can actually uh, deposit oils from your hands, even if they're very clean, uh, on the surface of the photograph. And after years and years and years, you will start to see a um, fingerprint show up on the emulsion layer of the photograph. Um, so for, for photographs, I would say almost always wear gloves for, but for like Daniel said, for paper materials, it's much safer to handle them with clean hands so that you can actually feel the paper as you're handling it. That is good to know. Yeah, um, helpful advice. <laughs> uh, so why is it important to have the original object rather than a digital version for research purposes? That's a good question. Um, there are many things that you won't be able to see um, on a digital copy. Um, 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 from a ecological point of view, I mean, there is no replacement for the real object to see a book in, and hold it and see um, its form. Uh, you just can't um, see all of it in, in an image. Um, so the understanding for researchers that want to understand how old books look like how they worked, um, see how a, how time affected them. Um, you just can't do it um, without the real thing. Um, so it's actually crucial to be able to preserve the original books. And um, if you research the content of books, then you can have the argument of, of using uh, the digital copy. That's a different story, yeah. Yeah, I think that that's a very complicated question and it depends on, you can argue for either side of the coin what's more important to preserve the content or preserve the object. And like Daniel said, I think it depends on what is important, but I think in most cases it's important to preserve both. It's important to have a digital surrogate that provides better access to folks. Um, but the original object tells us so much about the materiality of it, how it ages, 
If you want to perform any sort of scientific testing on something, you can't do that with a digital image. Um, but for cases like our audiovisual materials, some of those materials that the content was recorded on are just so fragile. Um, and in some cases, no matter what we do, we won't be able to preserve the physical object. And so the next best option for us is to get the content off of those carriers so that we can at least have that. Um, but there's been a lot of discussion, particularly with film in the past few years, about how we digitize it. So a lot of people just digitize the frame of the film, but there's also been a lot of discussion about doing edge to edge digitization. So you can actually see the sprockets of the film because that can also tell you a lot about the maker of the film um, to date it. And so, um, yeah, it's just constantly evolving discussion about that. Yeah, um, I saw a comment in the chat as well that, um, which is a great point, you know, individual copies of books or other um, materials can vary greatly. So the example that was given is um, at the Smithsonian, you know, we have a number of copies of Catsby's Natural History and each one is different. So um, I think that's another, another reason, you know, there are differences even in the individual items themselves. Um, so another question here. Um, so what is the best way to remove a book from a library shelf? Um, okay. <laughs> Live demonstration. Live demonstration. So instead of pulling a book off like this, what you wanna do is push the volumes to the side of it uh, and then pull it out by the spine. And as much as possible, if you can help it, not slide it around, but that is the safest way for books that are shelved vertically. <laughs> Amazing, beautiful. And one advice for everyone at home, don't overstack your shelves. If it's hard to pull out a book, and where what you do, it will you will use too much effort to pull that book out. Yeah, yeah. that is helpful. Helpful. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on the time. We are at six, but we do have a, a number of questions. So if our speakers are okay, I might keep going a little bit. Um, so let's see here. So. Um, what are some of the main sources of items in your collections and how are they determined as items be kept slash meet your collection development policies? Can you repeat that question, please? Sure. Well, so I think if Allison wants to start because I think it might be a little clearer from the archives perspective, um, the question was asking, what are the main sources of your collection? So where do, where do you get the things that are in your collections and how, how do you determine that they should be part of your collections? So with the archives, um, we're the institutional archives for the Smithsonian. So the majority of our records are gotten from the institution itself. Um, and I think I highlighted a bunch of them in my presentation. So we have anything from architectural drawings from all of the buildings that have been built um, to scientific um, documentation from researchers who have worked with the Smithsonian, um, expedition footage on films and video. Uh, so basically anything that has a connection to the Smithsonian and informs how our history as an institution is collected by us. Um, we don't typically purchase items um, or take donations from outside anything that has a Smithsonian connection. There are always exceptions for certain things, but the majority of our collection comes from inside the institution. Yeah, and actually I, I'll take a stab at answering on the the library side of things. Um, you know, each of our 21 library branches has its own area of, of 
um, research and interest. And so, you know, our, our librarians are curating those collections based on those, those subject areas. Um, but, you know, some of those libraries were started by really incredible donations of large collections. So for example, our Dibner Library, which is our, um, our, one of our special collections, rare book libraries, um, was given to us by um, a, a, through a donation of a very large collection of these rare books. Um, so, you know, it's something that's sort of constantly evolving. Um, but again, our, our librarians are the ones who are determining, um, you know, what needs to be in our collections based on the needs of the researchers that use those libraries. So, um, yeah, I hope that I hope that answers. Yeah, Kayla, go ahead. I just have one more thing to say. Um, for our digitization department, uh, the policy is that if it is important enough to spend the money and digital storage effort on, on digitizing the book, then we will keep the book. So when we digitize something, it doesn't get tossed out. Um, if you see something on BHL and you wanna see it in person, it's there. Thank you. Um, there are so many questions and not so much time. So I'm gonna try and find another one here. Um, this is an interesting one. So what types of films might be included in the audiovisual uh, preservation initiative? Yeah, I saw that one. So I want to be clear, we're not actually starting new archives for our audiovisual collection. So the initiative is um, basically going to act as a support unit for all of the Smithsonian museums and research centers that already exist. So we're providing a service to anything from Human Studies Film Archives, which has a, a lot of documentary um, films on indigenous cultures and languages that may no longer exist. Um, and so anything from around the institution, which is basically anything. <laughs> there are films from around the Smithsonian document a lot of different things, world history, American history, scientific discoveries. Um, so they all are gonna be coming through the initiative, hopefully. That's exciting. Um, so just looking through these questions, um, do some books have other materials like textiles, for example, used in their production to a degree that you might have to work with another specialist or a department or another department? Um, and if so, could you describe an experience like that? Um, in the short period I spent at the lab, I didn't encounter anything unusual like that. Um, but in the past, I had to rebind, rebind um, a book um, that was covered with velvet. Um, so that was very unusual and it did require some research of how, how to glue it back on and what is the best way to work with that material, uh, which was quite fragile. Um, so yeah, this, this kind of things sometimes do happen. Yeah, that we have unusual materials. A big, great variety of materials was used throughout the centuries to bind books, um, but not so often um, unusual textiles, yeah. Anyway, else? Yeah, you're muted. Okay. Um, on a related note, um, sometimes we've had to collaborate with uh, other departments um, for other reasons, not necessarily because of, of the binding material, um, but because of some other treatments. So we recently had a, a whole swath of books that it turned out had been treated with arsenic. Um, there, was, there was arsenic in the uh, gilding on the floor edges and stuff. Um, and we weren't really sure what to do with it. So first, uh, conservators from NS, uh, MSC, which is our Museum Support Center Conservation Lab, they work with objects primarily um, and do conservation-related research. 
um, they had to test it and confirm it and then gave us a treatment plan um, on how to isolate the items and then come up with a way of storing them in a way that would not be toxic to our librarians <laughs> uh, and the rest of our collections. So that was pretty cool. Great. Well, I think even though there are a lot more questions. Um, I don't want to keep people for too long. And um, there were a couple questions at the end here about adopt a book. And um, someone asked, do you have a wish list of particular items you need or want? Um, which I think, as I'm wrapping up here, um, I just I want to put in a plug for our um, upcoming virtual adopt a book salons. So. If you, if you liked what you saw and heard here today, I think you will definitely enjoy these upcoming events. Um, you know, we definitely, um, we, well, we typically hold an annual Adopt-A-Book fundraising event in person, uh, but this year we're taking it online and we'll be hosting a series of four um, very intimate events in March and April, where you'll have the opportunity to interact with our librarians and archivists and conservators um, in an even more interactive setting than this. So um, if, you, if that sounds interesting, uh, please make sure you're signed up for our email list to be the first to receive the details and the chance to reserve tickets. And you can sign up um, on our website at libraryscharchives.si.edu. Um, and, you know, I learned a lot today. I, I hope you did too. And, um, you know, there's obviously so much more and we will hopefully be able to, to get to some of these questions, um, you know, after today. Um, but if you have any further questions or comments or, or feedback, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, you can reach our advancement team at sla-rscp at si.edu. And you can also share your thoughts by filling out our short survey after this session ends. So thank you so much for joining us today and for staying a little late as well. And we hope you stay safe and healthy and have a good night. <laughs> Good night.